Now, we get something really exciting. Janry from the Philippines, who is actually serving in Japan right now, is going to come and bring us the message, and I'm excited to, to invite her. Janry, come on up. Thank you, Pastor Mike. Good morning, everyone. My name is January because I was born in January. My parents were trying to be creative back when I was born, so they removed the letter U, and that's my name. But if that's too hard to say, you can also call me Jana. And I'm so happy for um, the opportunity that you've given me to share with you today what God is doing in the Asia Pacific region where I serve, in Japan where I live, and also in my life. And um, my prayer is that you would be encouraged and that you would reflect on your lives as well and where you are today. So let's start with my story. Um, I will just say next slide, please. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, in the Philippines, we have the jeepney as our public transportation. Who among you here has been to the Philippines? Okay, we have a few people I talked to earlier that's been to the Philippines. And I want to start my story back in the Philippines where I grew up. I am a third generation Nazarene. And what that means is that my parents are Nazarenes, my grandparents are Nazarenes. And I grew up in the church, went there every Sunday. Who among you is like that? Are like that <laughs> okay you grew up in the church like me too but my relationship with Jesus did not start until I was nine years old so let's look at that screen with the jeepney please and a jeepney lost its brakes I was riding a white van like that at the bottom of the screen on the way home from our school and at the stoplight, the jeepney that lost its brakes hit us and the next thing that I know, I flew out of the vehicle and was trapped between the two vehicles and I was screaming and shouting and I said over and over again, Please forgive me for my sins. Please forgive me for my sins. I don't want to die. I don't want to die. I don't want to go to hell. Please forgive me for my sins. Now that I'm old, I'm thinking, why was I screaming that? Maybe another kid would have said, Mama, help me. But I was asking for forgiveness. <laughs> what kinds of sins at age nine, right? Um, now that I'm older and I look back at that experience, I believe that was God's grace already at work in my heart, showing me my need for a savior. So they brought me to the hospital and I was just so frightened because I had fractured legs, broken bones, and the Lord was so good and so powerful. He helped the doctors. They said, oh, she's still young. She's just nine, year, nine years old. The bones will grow back. They put braces. And now I can run. I can walk. I can dance. But on that hospital bed, I would still cry. And my aunt visited me. And she said, Jana, what is going on? Why are you crying so much? I'm so scared to die. I'm so scared because I have a lot of sins. I was crying like that. And she said, Jana, she looked me in the eye. Jesus loves you so much. He died on the cross for you and is offering you forgiveness if you believe in him he's offering you new life and he wants to have a relationship with you and i responded and i said really he would do that we prayed together and there was this peace that's that swept over me my guilt at age nine was lifted <laughs> And I started my walk with Jesus. I still have ugly marks on my legs today. But God has done a beautiful thing in my life when my relationship with him started and I experienced that love. And I've been walking with him ever since and just searching for the ways that I can partner with him on this journey as he moves with people and is working in the lives of people around me. And so today, I want us to look at Acts chapter 8. On the next slide, please. Acts chapter 8, verses um, 26 to 40. And we will look at the movement of God through the people of God, through the story of Philip. I like this story because 
Philip share the good news. And with my experience of my accident, like the verse in Romans 15, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. This has become a verse for me that I want to journey with the Lord and share the good news. So as we look at the story of Philip right now, you can see some similarities um, with the way I do my ministry in Japan and the Asia Pacific region. So we will not read the verses, but let's start from the moment when Jesus died on the cross and he was buried and the disciples were so scared. Do you remember what they did? They ran away, they hid, they were so disillusioned. It was not what they expected. But then when Jesus rose from the grave, he showed up to these fearful disciples and he said, peace be with you. And I like it when Jesus shows up when we're afraid because he calms our fears. Do you agree? And so he told the disciples, wait for the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit came, they received power to be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. It was this big Jesus movement that turned the world upside down. Not because of how capable or great or talented they were, but because of who was in them and who was with them. And this is where we see Philip in the story. Let's go to the next slide, please, with um, Philip's photo. Um, he was told by the Spirit to go to the desert road. Who among you here has been to a desert road? Okay, recently I was driving in the Northwest and I saw some of those desert roads and there was this big nothingness really. But I was thinking if I was Philip at that time and the Holy Spirit will tell me to go to the desert road, I would be like, no, who's in there? <laughs> I don't want to go there. There's so many action-packed things happening in Samaria. The demon possessed were freed from the spirits. The people who were sick were healed. They were receiving the good news, and I don't know about you, but I'm not so great with unknowns. Do you agree with that? We are not, human beings are not great with unknowns. But when Philip was called to go to the desert road, he obeyed and he partnered with what the Holy Spirit was doing in the life of the Ethiopian eunuch that he would meet on the road. When we are called to something that seems like an unknown, it's actually a call to the one who makes himself known. The one who is trustworthy. The one we can trust because he is the trustworthy one. So Philip went and he found this man who is like a seeker. On the next slide, please, we can see that the Ethiopian eunuch went to Jerusalem to worship. And on this um, desert road, he was on his way back and he was reading from the book of Isaiah, the prophet. This will be your homework later, okay? Read Isaiah 53. <laughs> so you can have an idea what this man was reading. And the Holy Spirit told again Philip to go near the chariot. And what happened? Let's look at the next slide. He went near the chariot and he asked a very simple question to the eunuch. Do you understand what you are reading? Now, I really like this question because it's a simple question that opened up to a bigger conversation between them. Now, that Ethiopian eunuch was a seeker, like I said. He went to worship, but he didn't understand all that he was reading. But for the seeking heart, the Lord provides. Do you have a seeking heart today? Now, what I love about this, the Lord's provision for this Ethiopian eunuch is Philip. And Philip went, partnered with what the Holy Spirit was doing in the life of this man. Because I tell you, the Holy Spirit is already at work in the lives of the people even before we show up. The, our lives, the lives of the people in our communities, even before we do anything, he's already at work in their lives. And so Philip partnered with what the Lord was doing and the eunuch responded and said, well, how can I unless someone explains it to me? So he invited Philip to join him in the chariot and he talked about this Messiah that came and humbled himself. Now we're celebrating Advent and we are remembering how God 
became one like us. Now, he is the suffering servant. He, Philip shared the good news and the eunuch believed. He was baptized and went on his way rejoicing. Now, let's imagine. Maybe that eunuch on his way back talked to the servants in the kingdom because he was a high-ranking official. Um, he was serving the queen of Ethiopia, not the Ethiopia that we know today, but some scholars said maybe South Sudan. And in that culture, the king didn't meddle with aff the affairs of the nation, and it was the queen that was kind of running their kingdom, and he was a high-ranking official. Now, if this eunuch was a servant... Can we imagine maybe he shared about his faith, about Jesus to the queen and the servants in the kingdom? Now, it could be a simple conversation that can open up to a bigger conversation. And if you imagine your lives today, you are where you are for a reason. And you are probably not aware how your simple conversations can open up to that bigger conversation about Jesus. Now, I still remember the very first time I moved to Japan in 2014. Let's go to the next slide, please. I had to remember to keep in step with the Holy Spirit because he will show the work that needs to be done, just like with Philip, right? And on the next slide, I was with this um, Japanese friend who was not a believer at that time. And because coming from the Philippines where we are free to share about Jesus and the good news, I was just so excited to share with her about Jesus. We were at that cafe and I was going on and on. As you can see, I'm just a very excited person all the time time and then she had this big question mark on her face she said jana it seems like this man is so important to you but why are you so happy that someone died have you ever heard that kind of response when you share about jesus and what he's done on the cross now, in the Philippines, when you talk about how Jesus died for us and how he became sin for us, something clicks in their heads. They are filled with gratitude. They are filled with just a response to follow Jesus. But for this friend of mine, I learned that, oh, she has never heard anything about Jesus. There is no folder. There's no experience about an encounter with Christians. On the next slide, please. In Japan, where I live, there's about 126 million people, and we can consider them an unreached people group. What that means is they don't have enough followers or resources to evangelize their own people. And right now, it's only about zero 0.57% evangelical Christians in their population. That's lots of big numbers. So let's just imagine your church full of 200 Japanese people. There will only be one Christian in this room. And so there's that big work that needs to be done in sharing the transforming love of Jesus. And so when people ask me what I do in Japan, Next slide, please. I invite them to my home. And so I remember that time when I invited a Christian friend to my house and she said, can I invite my friend too? And I was surprised. Do you have a friend like that, that you invite her or him and then they're already inviting another person too? Yeah. <laughs> so she explained to me quickly. She said, no, don't worry because um, I want to I want her to see a Christian because she's never seen other Christians before. And I want her to meet you so that she can see the difference. So I was like, oh, okay, I think I know what she's doing here. And from that moment on, I want to share a little bit about my life and invite people to my home because it's hard to invite them to the church where there's a lot of stigma. They don't want to go there. They don't want to be seen as the one who is different from their communities, their families, who, who believe in a different thing and have their own traditions. And so I try to use my interests. Who among you here loves to play video games? Ooh, okay, I love playing video games. And so when they ask me what I do in Japan, I invite them for video games, for Filipino food, who among you here has tried Filipino food? And these 
things attract my friends. They're like, oh, I want to try your food. Oh, I want to play with you. And then the simple conversations open up to a bigger conversation. What do you do for a living? Oh, you're a missionary? What does that mean? Oh, you're a Christian? What does that mean? And so we have this conversation. Another thing that allows me to build relationships is my are my own needs. For example, I need to be great with my Japanese language. And so I went to this website before I learned about Duolingo, who among you here uses that, learning another language. They should probably pay me for this because I always mention it. <laughs> if you want to learn a language, that's a good one. Um, so I went to this website, Language Exchange, and I typed there, I want to practice my Japanese language. Who among you wants to practice your English? And so this lady responded to me on the next slide. You can see her. And she said, I want to practice with you. So we met at a cafe, 30 minutes of Japanese, 30 minutes of English, and we tried to do that every month. And I was in this relationship with her for about a year and a half, and I prayed every single day for that opportunity that I can share about Jesus. And about two years after that, she invited me to go to the north of Okinawa because I lived five years in Okinawa. And she said, let's drive. Let's go on a drive. And I said, okay, let's go together. And on that drive, she asked me a simple question. Let's go to the next slide. What are you doing for Christmas? She said. Next slide. Are you having KFC for Christmas? Who among you here loves KFC? Ooh, these are my people. <laughs> I love KFC too. But in Japan, for many people, Christmas equals KFC. In fact, you have to place your order in November because you don't just go to the store the Christmas week. They would be closed. They're preparing all of the orders that were placed from a month before so that they can have their Christmas bucket meal. And so at that moment, I was laughing in the car because I said, Oh, Lord God, your ways. You answered my prayer at this very moment because we're driving to the north for two hours. She's not going anywhere. Anywhere. I'm going to talk to her about Chris, what Christmas means to me. And from that moment on, it's finding all these interests. I like calligraphy on the next slide. And that's one way that I can meet people. Then we have the simple conversations that could lead to bigger conversations. I moved from Okinawa to Kyoto and I lived there for two years. And there's a lot of university students there. Then I needed to prepare for my Japanese language proficiency test. And some of these students need to pre prepare for their TOEFL or IELTS, like the English language proficiency test. So I said, oh, let's do an exchange. So we helped each other and then invited them again to cafes on the next slide. I also like hip hop, who among you here likes to dance? So I, I attend the dance classes and then after the dance classes, we go eat and have our simple conversations. And recently I moved to Fukuoka and there is a big tennis court there near my house. Who among you here plays tennis? I don't, <laughs> but hey, now I see another big opportunity for me to learn something, meet people, start with the simple conversations. And it's always that keeping in step with the Holy Spirit because it's not our work alone. He's already at work in the lives of these people. We just have to partner with what the Lord is doing with them. Another thing I do in the Asia Pacific region is with NYI. It's Nazarene Youth International. You can see it on the screen. And our message with NYI is that young people are important in the kingdom of God. Young people, where are you? Raise your hands. You are important in the kingdom of God. Amen. Sadly, in many of the countries where I serve, young people need to really wait for when they are older to have a voice and to be able to participate in what God is doing in the church and the kingdom. It's just this culture of hierarchy where, you know, maybe as a young kid, a young teenager, you are not seen. One missionary entered a church and she asked the pastor, oh, how many people? How many people do you have here? And he can see about 120 people. And the pastor responded, oh, there are 20 people. And so the missionary was baffled. 
20 I see about 100 and that's because the pastor did not count the children and the young people and so this is one of the challenges when you feel like you are not seen or you don't have a voice or you don't even have a way to serve but our message with NYI is that you are important in the kingdom of God and we will provide opportunities for you to serve because the Holy Spirit that the disciples received is the same Holy Spirit that is in us and is also in the younger generation. Amen? You have received the power to be his witnesses. And so if you look at the interests that I mentioned earlier, what are your interests? Let's not separate that from what God is doing in our midst. Sometimes, sometimes we think, oh, the service I can do only happens inside the walls of the church. But it's our day-to-day, -day, what we do in the workplaces, in our classrooms, in our communities, in our families, and in the lives of our friends that we can partner with what the Lord is doing. In Japan, on the next slide, please. Um, we have about 70 Nazarene churches and only about 30 have young people. And when I say they have young people, maybe that's just one middle school student or one young adult. And can you imagine how lonely or how sad that can be for that young person? So when you think about Japan and the ministry I do there, please pray for these young people that they would step up and listen and partner with how the Lord is calling them to reach their generation. Um, sometimes when we are invited to join God in what he is doing, we worry about our past. We worry about what we have experienced or if we even have the ability but the encouragement i always give to our people is that the lord is not just looking for your ability but your availability because when we say yes to him he gives us the resources to be able to do the work in japan there is an artwork called kintsugi and i really love this because what do we usually do with broken pottery or with broken things we throw it away. We don't have any need for that. But with kintsugi, you mix the gold powder with lacquer and you put together the broken pieces. And it becomes this beautiful artwork where they don't hide the cracks. They don't hide whatever has happened, but it becomes part of their the pottery's history. And I love this because this is what Jesus does in our lives. Do you agree? He is working in whatever brokenness we have experienced in the past and even in our present. And he is the one at work in us like the treasure in jars of clay. And if you think that the Lord cannot work in your life, he is at work always, every day, whatever brokenness you are experiencing. You know, for me during the pandemic in 2020, who among you here experienced the pandemic? <laughs> Did we experience that here? <laughs> the whole world experienced um, many different things during the pandemic. Many loved ones um, lost their lives. And a lot of us experienced so many different um, anxiety-inducing things. Um, so I actually moved to Japan in 2014 with my husband. And at the end of 2020, his reaction to all that has happened is to walk away from the Lord and in effect to walk away from our marriage too. And so at that moment, I was so broken. I was just so, um, I was in a difficult space and I was praying to the Lord, Lord, um, what do I do now? How do I explain to the people I'm reaching out to who's never even started their walk with Jesus yet, and I'm just still waiting for the moment that they would start walking with Jesus, this concept of walking away from him, because they know my husband, they would ask about him, and that moment happened. And I was praying to the Lord, Lord, do I share about what happened? And the Holy Spirit prodded me to be vulnerable and just share and remembering that it's not just my work and it is his work then I shared when my friend asked what happened are you okay 
you know, if you know or don't know, Japanese people are very reserved. In the Philippines, if you go to the grocery store and wait in line at the register, in five minutes, they'll tell you their whole life story. But Japanese people, um, in my experience, it takes about a year or two years of consistent meeting and building relationship before they even open up about their hearts. When I shared about my brokenness during the pandemic, this lady, all the walls between us were broken. And she just started opening up her heart, opening up about her brokenness. And there was the melding of hearts. I had the opportunity to talk about this walk and what it means to walk with Jesus even in the midst of a difficult time. Like Isaiah 53 was talking about the suffering servant, Jesus. He is the one who truly understands our sorrow, our pain, whatever difficulty you are going through because he became like us. He is with us. And if you are going through some sort of brokenness today, let me encourage you. He is faithful and you are not alone, just as I have experienced that even now in my ministry. And so it's not without difficulty and lots of tears, but even in my brokenness, I can't understand how the Lord is doing this, but he is still working in the lives of the people around me. I just have to partner with him. And so he is the one who gives us power. Amen. And he is with us, his promise that he is with us until the end. The invitation for you today is this. Would you join him in his movement in the world so that this world that has been separated from our creator can find the forgiveness and the new life and the transforming love that we can find in Jesus through your lives. Remember, the harvest is plenty, but the workers are few. Would you join him in his movement in the world? Now, I don't know how the Lord is speaking to your hearts right now. Maybe there is a desert road that he is calling you to, and he wants you to take that step of faith. Or maybe there is that person in your community that the Lord is showing your putting in your heart right now this face you can see in your mind right now or there is an interest that you really 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 love to do and you are not sure what's the place of that in the kingdom of God there is space for that too let us all pray and as you pray for me please also pray for the people of Japan the Lord loves them, and I know that they are yearning for a love that is true, a love that makes all things new, a love, just like we sang earlier, that will transform and make all things beautiful. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, um, thank you for your word of the example of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. And how simple conversations can open up to bigger conversation. Lord, please help us to take that step of faith. Please fill us with your spirit and transform us to become more and more like Jesus. So that the people will experience who Jesus is in our lives, through our lives, as we talk with them, interact with them, and they can truly see the difference of what you and your work could do in the life of every person. And so, Lord, I don't know what brokenness each, each person is facing today, maybe with their relationships or health or just all the negative things that they have to face each day. My prayer, Father, is that you would help them experience your presence in a deeper way. Lord, we, you don't need our help in order to make a difference in this world. And yet, you invite us to join you so that we can know you in a deeper way. And so we want that. And your promise is that you will be with us. 
You are the one who will satisfy our heart's longings. As we face this week and um, the days to come, Lord, we're not going to hide the broken parts of us, but we will be bold because your light will shine through the crevices, all these um, spaces, and people will get to know who you are in our lives. We thank you for the work you're doing in Japan. Help us to continue to pray and partner in the ways you call us to. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.